So the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art proudly presents Momentum 2021. And tonight's special guests, Mindy Roberts, Laura James, and Brian Walsh, contributors to the book they'll be sharing this evening, We Are Puget Sound. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land that the museum is located on is the Aboriginal territory of the Sequabsh people, the people of clear salt water or Suquamish people. Expert fishers, canoe builders, and basket weavers, the Sequabsh live in harmony with the lands and waterways along Washington's Central Salish Sea as they have for thousands of years. Here, the Sequabsh live and protect the land and waters of their ancestors for future generations as promised by the Point Elliott Treaty of 1855. We pay respects to their elders past and present. This year's Momentum Festival centers on exploring the natural world, featuring online presentations, discussions like this one, concerts, and more. Um, to see the full lineup and get more information, you can visit our website, um, RSVP on event pages, and we'll send you reminders um, and links to each event. Momentum is a PRISM program of the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art. PRISM is a cultural catalyst delivering intimate curated performances, presentations, and cultural celebrations that explore the personal connection between artist and audience. Bima thanks our generous supporters, the city of Bainbridge Island and Kitsap County. As a free museum that relies on our members and donors, every dollar counts. Join Bima on our website or make a donation in any amount at the address on the screen or in the link that I will send in the chat in just a moment. Um, but I'd like to hand it over to Mindy Roberts from the Washington Environmental Council, who will get us started this evening. Great, thank you, Emma. I'll go ahead and share my own screen here. All right, well, hello, everyone. And we sure wish we could be in person with everyone, but that is just not an option right now um, as we're getting, getting used to this uh, strange world, but we definitely look forward to engaging in, in person. Uh, my name is Mindy Roberts. I'm the Puget Sound Program Director for Washington Environmental Council and uh, was very fortunate to be involved in this project with a number of uh, collaborators, collaborators who I'll, I'll introduce in just a moment. Uh, but I did want to uh, let you know, I'll, I'll show a few slides and images from the, uh, from the book itself, and then introduce to you Brian Walsh, who's a photographer, the primary photographer for the book, and then also Laura James, a videographer who is one of the people profiled in We Are Puget Sound. And you'll get to hear their stories of how they use photography and videography really to connect people to uh, this place. Thank you, uh, Bima, for that uh, acknowledgement of the lands that we're on. I'm joining you from the lands of the Puyallup tribe in Tacoma. And while I'm speaking on behalf of, of this group, it really is an enormous group of people. And first, I wanted to acknowledge the tremendous work of Braided River. Uh, Braided River is a nonprofit publisher, and they do absolutely fantastic conservation work. We're really indebted to Erica Lundahl, Helen Cherulo, and a cast of characters there that this would not have happened with all of their work. Uh, the primary writer, Dave Workman, and Brian Walsh and I uh, had this idea a few years ago, and uh, it's been really uh, gratifying to see it come to fruition with the additional work of Brian Cantwell on the travel section, Martha Kongsgaard for the phenomenal um, entryway into We Are Puget Sound, and then I had the fortune to work with Suquamish Tribe Chairman Leonard Forsman on the, uh, the future of Puget Sound and the Salish Sea. So just wanted to acknowledge all of the folks who have been involved in this project over time. So how did this all get started and, and what is the role that it plays? Um, we all live in a remarkable place here where I can't think of another place around the world that has world-class animals like, like killer whales that are literally leaping out of the water in, in front of so many people, millions and millions of people um, live in this area. Um, and the, the orcas face a number of threats. There's not enough salmon to sustain them. Uh, there's too much pollution and there's too much vessel noise and, and disturbance. And the orcas are relying on resources that have also fueled people for millennia, not just food sustenance, but culture and spiritual beliefs as well. And there's so many things that we focus on today that are just not going right. There's a lot of things trending in the wrong direction right now, but we knew 
having done this work in advocacy, that there are really remarkable people doing great work in their communities. People like Laura, who you'll hear from today. Also folks like Kyle and Emma here who volunteer their time to teach people about shorelines around the Salish Sea. What we wanted to do was bring these stories of hope, the work that is being done by individuals who have a deep connection to place, but they also have a deep connection to each other. And that really was what drove uh, the, um, the publication of We Are Puget Sound. And also We Are Puget Sound uh, is, is a, it's an action campaign. It's more than a coffee table book. And on this, as uh, uh, Chairman Forsman and I talked about, what would we want to share with people about what we see in Puget Sound and the Salish Sea? What would we want people to do in the future? And you'll hear tonight about some things that you can do to reduce your impacts. And that is absolutely critical for the work that needs to be done. But we also need fundamental systemic changes. And that starts with things like voting. Um, holding our elected officials accountable, but it's also doing things like eating local um, and sustaining your local economy. And maybe that includes rewarding businesses who are part of the food economy. So as we talk tonight, what I'm going to ask you to do is be thinking about these 10 actions and how you would tailor those for your own community. So for example, I live in Tacoma and I have the great fortune to have um, a relationship with a farmer who has a has a CSA and I'm able to eat food coming from the Puyallup River Valley. So that's something that I can do personally. But what's something that you can do personally? So if you wouldn't mind using the chat, tell us a little bit about where you are, uh, where you're coming from, but also what you might do in each of these 10 areas um, to tailor it to the needs of your community. And that might be Bainbridge Island, uh, but it sounds like it's well beyond Bainbridge Island as well. So let's take a tour of, of this place. Uh, the, the Puget Sound and the Salish Sea really starts in the mountains around us. Um, the Cascade Mountains, the Olympic Mountains as well, that are just absolutely filled with snow right now. We're very fortunate to have an abundant snow year. And those alpine areas are home to critters, like the quite photogenic uh, pika here. Um, and it's also a playground for people. People getting outside and enjoying this area around us is such a great way to connect with place. Um, and recreation is, is a, it's just good for your body, frankly. Um, so getting up into alpine areas or anywhere you can to physically get outside has been a really important um, support for our emotional psyches during at least the past, the, the past year that's been so challenging for folks. But Puget Sound and the Salish Sea are defined by water, including the snows and the glaciers and the alpine areas, but uh, also rainfall that falls on the grand forest, including the Douglas fir here, and which gathers into great torrents of, of water, um, including the Elwha River, which is where this particular uh, photo is from. And you can see the, the trees and the water that are moving downstream. It's important to remember that, that rivers and streams are also highways for salmon that spend their adult years out in the Pacific Ocean fattening up, um, and they're bringing those nutrients back into the Puget Sound and the Salish Sea region, and, and basically coming back to the streams where their eggs were hatched um, to share their nutrients uh, with their young, with each other, and with the forests around them. And that's part of a grand cycle that has been happening for millennia. And um, there are people uh, who, whose ancestors have been in this area for literally thousands and thousands of years who have relied on the natural resources that this place provides. It's not just natural resources, it's also connections with the environment and wildlife that we, we see around us. Uh, for many people, folks were discovering birds in their backyard for the first time ever. I think there was a great boom in backyard birding as well. So that's on the land side of things, but the shoreline is, is where most of our views end. For folks who aren't like a diver like Laura, we see the shoreline and it's really an amazing place here. Um, but there are some critters that get to see below Puget Sound and the Salish Sea, um, including, including these folks. The shoreline itself is inhabited by so many more uh, creatures that, that come out at low tide and, and again, feed themselves and forage um, on the intertidal uh, life. 
but below the water is an absolute riot of color. And I had an opportunity a couple weeks ago at Cama Beach to do, when, when we had that amazing string of beautiful weather, I had a chance to go stand up paddle boarding over an area. And I remember I was so thrilled because I was seeing sea stars for the first time in so long after being really decimated by sea star wasting a couple of years ago, um, life is starting to return. And I'm sure, I'm sure glad to see it. But divers and photographers are able to share these amazing images like the lion's mane uh, jellyfish here that's featured in the book um, and also encounters with the giant Pacific octopus. So you can definitely go see these at the Seattle Aquarium, but I imagine it does not do justice to being able to see um, these creatures under the water. And it's really it's divers uh, and photographers who are able to bring us images that all is not entirely well under the water. And this is an image from one of Laura's videos that shows a, a plume of, of uh, debris that's being washed off of the streets um, and directly into Puget Sound really without any, any significant treatment. And it's bringing all sorts of pollutants with it. But most people have no idea this is happening because they simply can't see under the water. And that's where photographer, photography and videography, it connects people in ways that they can now see the problem. Um, and, and we know that there have been changes to the land side of the world because we can see things like um, logging over the years that has provided economic benefits for some, but it's had unintended consequences for others, including things like damaging um, salmon habitat. But it's also our everyday activities. As, as we move around in the region, our activities on the land side end up changing the habitat and making it not quite as, as good for salmon um, and also add more pollution into the environment as well, including on the right hand side. It looks nice and clear, but it, it actually has quite a bit of pollution that's coming off of the 520 bridge in Seattle. But these sorts of things are happening all the time. And when, when we um, are unaware of it, it's hard to really tackle it and fix the problem. And it's only through photos and videos that we're able to make some changes. We're also really fortunate in this region to have folks like Tamina Martelli on the left, who is ripping up uh, pavement uh, in, in areas and creating food gardens for immigrant and refugee communities. Um, it's people like uh, Babe Karras on the right-hand side, who along with the Bainbridge Island Land Trust, uh, basically removed 1,500 feet of shoreline armory and now has returned that to a more natural state that's home to herring and other forage fish. It's folks like Betsy Peabody, who's another Bainbridge Island uh, resident and runs the Puget Sound Restoration Fund doing the science behind what is it that we need to do? How do we restore native species? It's also tribal leaders like Jeremy Sullivan, uh, who leads the Port Gamble uh, Squalum tribe. And he tells stories in the book about uh, the, the mill that was in Port Gamble and how important it was from an economic perspective. But at the same time, because of some of the pollution there, it's eliminated the chance for some of their elders to dig shellfish in Port Gamble Bay. So today, more and more, we simply are needing to connect through glass, which is, can feel like such an impediment right now. And right now, we're, we're all connecting with each other through glass, but it's still a connection. And I think that these connections are so critically important, because when I think about what is this little girl going to face in the future, what is her future going to look like? I want her to enjoy what I enjoy about this area. I want her to have access to local food. I want her to reward businesses that do good work as well. And it really is about how do we leave a legacy for future generations? So that brings us back to the 10 actions here. And again, we just invite you in the chat, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, where you live and then also how could you tailor something like this um, for, for your own community? And in particular, maybe thinking about the way that art can connect people to experiences uh, in Puget Sound. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and I'm about to introduce uh, Brian and Laura. So Brian, you go ahead and start sharing your own screen. Um, and here we go. Um, as Brian and Laura are speaking, by the way, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to uh, pose some questions to them. And that way they can both get back to you as we go. And then after they both speak, we'll have a chance to ask some more Q, do some more Q&A together. Um, but please join me um, in welcoming Brian Walsh, an environmental planner and nature photographer who has spent 30 years exploring mm -hmm. the coastal lowlands and mountains of the Pacific Northwest with his camera. And through his photography of people, 
wildlife and landscapes, Brian expresses environmental advocacy for the precious places we all cherish. Over to you, Brian. Thank you, Mindy. It's been a great honor to be invited here tonight to talk about uh, nature and photography. Those are the two things that I have a great passion for. And uh, this project, uh, Mindy, we kind of alluded to, some people refer to Puget Sound as Yellowstone at your doorstep, because in fact, you can step outside uh, and go to a, a beach or maybe your house and, and perhaps see wildlife just, you know, just before your eyes. And it's an extraordinary resource that we have here. And I've been trying to explore this and make those connections with my camera for the last uh, 30 years, but for this project for the last 10 years. And so I'd like to share some images with you that kind of help tell that story. And uh, we can have some further discussion later. So uh, I do want to talk about um, art has inspired, uh, art has been inspired by nature since time immemorial. And I think we need to understand that certainly uh, the Salish tribal um, indigenous people understood this and they had such a deep and inviting connection with the natural world, uh, not only in terms of their, um, their regalia, but also in their way of life. And so, uh, and it's also very tied, of course, to their sustenance. Uh, they were so in tune to the natural, natural world because uh, their very survival was dependent upon it, whether it was the salmon runs or the berries, the hunting and gathering culture that they had. And so that brought them in very direct connection with nature and uh, they had a great appreciation for that very reason. At the same time, um, you can see the evidence of nature in, in their artwork itself with the symbols that are very rich and that are told often through carvings, uh, basketry, uh, clothing that was made, um, those elements all exist there. And in some cases, uh, they tell stories. They're stories of origin stories that are very powerful and so incredibly important to their culture. And they're preserved in these artifacts, these, these works of art. And we are fortunate in this area, there are examples of this that you can see in the greater Puget Sound and Salish Sea area. So I want to shift to talk about uh, thoughts of nature and photography, kind of some of the perspective I've had over the years, and uh, hopefully this will be of interest to you as well. Um, there are, um, you know, I'm drawn to the natural world uh, too, also because of the inspiration that I find there. Um, Puget Sound, this Puget Sound uh, project really has en enabled me to get very immersed in this over this uh, number of years uh, working on this project. Typically as a photographer, you think of things like line and shape, forms of objects, uh, texture and color. And certainly those are elements in my photography, but uh, a lot of it goes much deeper. It's really to that sort of spiritual level of, of, of deep appreciation and connectedness. And that, that's what I wanna talk about is I, I share some of these photos with you. A lot of it I think starts with us as we're children, our first experiences out in nature. And if you were fortunate enough to grow up in the Salish Sea area, maybe your first uh, experiences in nature were on a beach. And I think as children explore these areas long before they've ever owned a camera, they're already touching and sensing and getting in tune with the natural world. And we have to do everything we can to uh, encourage that with children. There's so much, there's talk about nature deficit disorder today that children are spending so much time in front of their their uh, screens on their phones and uh, maybe watching television and other things and computer games and the like and not getting out enough in nature. There's been a lot of studies to show that uh, a person's emotional health and even their physical health uh, can, be, can benefit from exposure to nature. So I really hope that we can keep that alive and make the uh, childhood experiences um, meaningful and, and healthy for children as we go forward. So turning to the photography, I mentioned the spiritual connection. I, I too feel a spiritual connection when I'm in the wilds. And if I encounter a creature such as this great blue heron, I can't help but when I'm looking in the eyes of this creature, I, I sense another soul there. And I, I do feel that there are, are spirits within the natural world and certainly in the animal kingdom. And as a photographer, I'm very drawn to that. And I feel very, um, immersed in that when I'm in, in, in a natural setting. And it has, it has great impact on me uh, emotionally. But I also feel a spiritual connection with the land itself. And a lot of my work is actually landscape photography. And here's an example. This is uh, White Horse Mountain uh, near Darrington and a, a winter storm that has enveloped this mountain. And there's just an unmistakable mystery to this picture as you can just see little glimpses of the mountain, but not the mountain in its entirety. 
and it's being enveloped and it's changing moment by moment. So uh, there's a lot of mystery in the natural world. Science does not have all the answers and I, some of that mystery is very powerful and, and necessary, I think, to our appreciation in nature. But in addition to mystery, there's also great raw power in nature. Uh, here's an example of Snoqualmie Falls. I had the good fortune a few years ago, right after uh, some winter storms had come through and just the rumble of this falls and the spray in my face and the visceral experience of being there, it was just mystical. And I don't know if any or many of you have had this, this many of you have had this experience of, uh, of witnessing this, but it was really one of the great spectacles in our region. And just again, uh, reverberates within me as a photographer. And uh, there was a power, I still remember this moment taking this picture. And then there's a sublime. Uh, I had the good fortune also of traveling along Hood Canal one, one winter morning as the sun was coming up and just the quality of life and the, the serenity and beauty of that scene uh, was very, uh, enriching and, and very inspiring to me. And there's been so many times where I've had similar scenes in other places, but it's a very special uh, time of day in the morning where the light is soft and the colors are very distinct. Um, and this, this was one of my favorite times and one of my favorite images from that. But another aspect of nature that really inspires me is uh, the design of nature. And there are so many exquisite designs among various creatures and also uh, plants. And this is a wood duck, which uh, to me looks as painterly as anything I can imagine. In fact, uh, it almost looks like, it looks unreal. It looks like a painting that was done by Van Gogh or Cezanne. And uh, it is just exquisite in its overall design and the, the choice of colors. And it's interesting, I mean, people do paint wood ducks and, and other types of ducks as a form of artwork, but seeing them in their natural form is, is just inspiring. I just can't uh, say enough about that. But uh, color is, uh, is omnipresent in nature and color also evokes a very strong uh, emotional responses from people. There have been studies about this. And this is a purple sea star and it's obviously the most uh, emblematic aspect of it is its color and this, this purple color, which seems almost unreal and unnatural in the world. Uh, and yet here it is. Uh, it seems almost an improbable color in nature, um, but it, exquisite. And then also, of course, you have uh, symmetry. This is a case of radial symmetry. So the combination of the two are just fascinating to me. But if you strip away color from the natural world and photographers have the ability to do this, uh, we can reduce the world to tonality and I, I find that nature is also revealed sometimes in this, uh, this way as well. This is low tide at uh, uh, Woodard Bay uh, near Olympia in, in southern uh, Puget Sound area. And I just love all the patterns of the mud flats and the trees and the reflections in the water and the tonal representation here. It's just very dramatic and uh, I think it's very satisfying as a, to a photographer. And so there's ways of exploring the sound that uh, don't always uh, focus on color. I think people tend to respond mostly to color, but uh, black and white also has a power all of its own. Then another aspect I think of uh, with Puget Sound, and maybe it's more uh, in the past than in the present, but some, some places you can still see this, is the sheer abundance of resource. And these are uh, snow geese that are in the Skagit Flats in the winter time, and there are just massive flocks of them there. In fact, this is so dense, as you can see, you can't even see through this flock to the other side. And I think that just kind of boggles the mind in terms of the abundance of, of these creatures. And there's great flapping and honking as, as they are taking off. But uh, more and more our resources are, are diminishing and we don't get to see these great spectacles of nature anymore, but there are still places where they're, and the goal really here is to rebuild population so we get to see this, whether it's salmon, uh, various bird species, uh, mammals and others that uh, these were great migrations and uh, need to continue and be rebuilt in the modern age. And so that's one of the great challenges as we get into restoration. I also turn my attention often to the microcosm of our region. And this was a, a fall morning, uh, probably the day before a spider had woven this web and then a uh, fog appeared and uh, all of the dew droplets were deposited almost with great precision onto this web. It looks like a series of jewels, almost like a pearl necklace of sorts, 
um, but it was just exquisite to me and uh, in a very ephemeral kind of thing. I'm sure within a day or two, this was probably the wind would tear at it or whatever, it'd be gone. Uh, but for this brief moment that morning, it was just the most superb thing that I think I had ever seen. So this is at the microcosm scale. And then in Puget Sound, we have the macro. And uh, this picture, just to give a sense of scale, it, it's such an extraordinary scale, it's hard to even conceive of this. This is sunrise at sunrise on Mount Rainier. And you're looking at about 8,000 vertical feet of relief uh, from the base of Mount Rainier to the top from this, this particular elevation. And so it's hard to even imagine uh, that much. And in terms of the, the massive glaciers that are pouring off the mountain and Little Tahoma that's on the left, which is a very sizable peak in its own right, but dwarfed by Mount Rainier, it really says a lot about scale. So one of the things about photography, it can capture that sense of scale. And it just adds to the overall wonder of the natural world that uh, there are just amazing things, uh, very massive things, very tiny things. And uh, it just really fascinates me every time I go out. And then there's just the serenity of nature. Uh, this is uh, Lake Crescent up on the Olympic Peninsula on a perfectly calm day, as you can see, the water's so calm, it's just like a, a mirror and the clouds and sky reflected there. It's just a splendid uh, representation. And I just felt so fortunate to be there this, that day to capture this moment. And there's poetry in nature. And I find sometimes even in these macro photography images, uh, you discover things like this, it's just a very simple uh, sword fern that is uh, raveling around itself almost in, in, a, in a spiral kind of pattern. And I just find it uh, exquisite in its own right and its complexity, but also its, its symmetry. It seems uh, almost mathematical in some ways, but uh, very poetic uh, to my eye. And they come to salmon again. And uh, Mindy talked about the salmon and their great migrations. I mean, this is one of the most extraordinary migrations on the planet. And we get the good fortune of seeing this typically in the fall, although there are different runs at different times of the year. But the fall run is probably the largest one. These were chum salmon in Kennedy Creek, not far from uh, Olympia. And these salmon were near extinction uh, a few years ago, and they made some changes in managing the fishery there. And now they've come back into the tens of thousands. And it's an extraordinary spectacle if you get an opportunity to see salmon in the wild. So often when people go to look at salmon spawning, it, you end up going to a place where there's a hatchery and, and they're not really spawning in the wilds. But these fish do spawn in the wilds and they do a very elaborate uh, courtship and uh, it's fascinating to study this. And as a photographer, I just felt so honored and privileged to be able to take these pictures uh, of these, uh, these fish as they had returned, uh, very fresh from the sea. And then just uh, the ethereal quality of light. And a few years ago, I went with my son on a kayak trip around the San Juan Islands. And the last day of the trip, we went uh, from Posey Island where we were camping over to Henry Island. And uh, this was the scene as we pulled up our kayaks and the sunset in the distance. And the quality of the light in the summertime there with this very calm water again and just the reflection in the sky, it was just exquisite. And the, the sky had a salmon pink kind of color to it and the intense uh, yellow on the horizon. It's still one of my favorite pictures uh, from the book, but uh, it hopefully will inspire you to get on a kayak and explore some areas around the sound as well. So my final uh, slide here is really just a picture I took at the procession of the species. This is an annual event in Olympia where people dress up as their favorite <laughs> creatures and plants. And uh, there's a, a big parade there. There's no motorized anything, no signs allowed, no political speeches. It's just people dressed up in nature. And uh, half of the town comes out to see it. It's, it's really quite the event. But I think it shows there's a longing today for the connection to the natural world. We live in this modern age and we're all on Zoom calls and spending a lot of time on our phones and driving down freeways. But if you really ask people what they'd rather be doing, I think most people would rather be out in nature somewhere or in this case, even dressing up like a natural creature. I think that speaks a lot about the, the power of, of nature, even in our modern age today, and how much people really care about that. And I think that connecting people to the natural world is one of the most important things we can do moving forward in the conservation movement. So that is my last slide. And I will turn it back over to stop sharing.
Thank you so much, Brian. I always love seeing your additional images. Um, some of those are in the book and others others are not. Um, but as we um, anybody, most of them were not in the book, but I hope <laughs> there, there are some that are, yes. All right. Well, don't forget to use the uh, the chat. Thanks for the folks who have shared where they where they're um, uh, zooming in from, and a little bit about uh, some things that you're appreciating in your neck of the woods. Um, and also use the Q and A function to pose some questions for uh, for Brian um, as he uh, as he's now available to answer questions. And we'll come back to this after uh, Laura's presentation as well. Um, so next, it's my pleasure to introduce Laura James who co-directs Toxic, which educate, uh, educates uh, people on toxics in stormwater runoff. A diver, citizen scientist, and videographer, Laura connects people to the problems of stormwater through innovative video storytelling, including virtual reality and 360 degree video. Over to you, Laura. Oops, you're on mute, got to unmute. Okay, there we go. Success. <laughs> Success. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. It's an honor to be here. Um, I'd like to speak to you tonight about being immersed in con uh, conservation. We've just had this wonderful discussion with Brian Walsh. Whoops, why are we not playing? About uh, photography. And as we know, as we know, photos speak a thousand words. When you see that picture, all of the feelings that they invoke. Um, so I got this idea. I thought, well, if a photo speaks a, a whole lot of words, what about a video? Hmm. Why is my thing not working here? I'm so sorry, guys. We're all living in technology today. No problem, Laura. Of course, it there works we go. in practice. Ah. There we go. Works. <laughs> there we go. Excellent. People protect what they love, but they must know it to love it. So I decided that immersive media was going to be my medium. We have a, a lot of incredible photographers out there who, I, I mean, they just make the most beautiful art. And I'm a videographer, so I share moving pictures, which I feel they um, really kind of build on that story and share it in a different nuanced way. And then I thought, I, I was out um, diving one day and I ran into this storm drain. And we'll see pictures of it soon. You saw it in Mindy's um, presentation earlier. And I thought, you know, I've been shooting this with flat video, flat being um, right there on your screen like you guys are watching now with this Zoom call. And I thought, you know, I saw 360 video, which is where it's you're in a headset like this guy, <clears throat> you're in a headset, a VR headset, and you're looking through these eyes, these little eyepieces, and you're able to look around at the whole environment, the whole video. And I thought, this is what I've been waiting for. Because now people can, we live in this crazy fast paced world and we're just, we're inundated by everything, all the computers and, and, and noise. And, and I think we all have kind of <laughs> really got our fill of that. But when you put this headset on, it, it, it transports you to another world. And in my case, an underwater world. You're in your own private theater and you're without distractions. And so as a content creator, to me, this is an amazing opportunity because you're no longer like, oh, what time is it? Don't I have a meeting? Oh, I got a text. You're actually totally immersed in the video. And I do a lot of these and I've had really, really um, positive results, um, all ages and all venues because of this crazy, amazing captive audience. So a little bit more about what I do. I believe that the undersea world is one of the most magnificent places. And that bounty that Brian spoke about earlier, I see it, I still see it. I mean, we have had a massive biodiversity loss in Puget Sound over the past 30 years. I've been diving for 31 years now. <laughs> and the biodiversity loss is there, but we still have moments of incredible beauty and bounty. This is a dive site um, up north. This is Keystone Jetty. And what you're seeing here, it looks a little distorted, right? 
Well, this is what's called equirectangular projection. So when you look at a sphere like a globe, everything is wrapped around it, right? The North Pole and the South Pole and the continents all around. But what happens when you flatten that globe out? The top and the bottom get distorted. So that's what you're seeing here. If you looked at this in a headset, it would be surrounding you all the way around. You would be diving with me. You would be my dive buddy. The problem is we have all this beauty, but we're making such a mess of things. These are those storm drains that were discussed earlier. One day I was diving out here right off of Alki Beach and I swam up and I saw this kind of piling, what I thought was a piling from a distance. And the closer I got, the more I realized this wasn't a piling at all. This was a column of storm water billowing up billowing and billowing up and it was unstoppable and it was constant and it was black and dark and grimy and and the the, the 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 particles were flowing down from it falling down covering everything around them and at the time i i filmed it in flat with flat video cameras and and it was pretty good but the problem i got back was that people were like hey laura you might be editorializing this narrative a bit and i'm like huh and they're like, you know, I feel like you're just showing us the worst stuff to prove your point. And I'm like, what? <laughs> That's not what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm just sharing what I see. In fact, I'm just telling the story. So the pictures are what kind of match the story. I'm not even showing you the worst of it. I'm not showing you the decaying black masses. I'm just showing you animals with stuff sprinkled on them. So when I saw that 360 video, I realized this is, this is it. This is what I needed because now, now I'm not editorializing a thing. The beauty of 360 video is that you, the viewer, are the director. I'm no longer showing you what you have to look at. Your own curiosity is showing you. You're looking around and you're seeing the world around you. And you can look at the billowing storm water coming up, but you can also turn all the way around and see that nasty debris trail. And so like this medium, this emerging medium gives me the most incredible opportunity to share without editorializing the narrative. This is a big storm drain right off of Alki Beach. This is a smaller one over by Salties on Alki. They're everywhere. This is another one off of Alki Point. And of note, we actually did just have a sewer spill out on Alki. So be careful if you're heading into that water. I know the days are sunny. <clears throat> and this is inside one of those storm drains. I pushed my camera inside it. And so what you're seeing, this kind of gray brown water is the storm water running off of our streets and highways. And you see that kind of mixing layer. That's actually where fresh water and salt water mixes because fresh water is light, it floats, it rises up. And so you see, when you look in these storm drains, you'll see like half of the water is clear salt water and the other half is nasty fresh water from the streets. And so this is, this is the, the drains eye view, if you will. That's me in there. So I believe that emerging media is the future of ocean conservation. I really do. And Puget Sound is our backyard, my backyard, my home. And so this is where I start. This is where I got my start and this is where I'm building outward. And I believe that conservation starts both at home and both out in the world. Sometimes it's different. I clean up my little area and then my conservation bridges outwards. For other people, they go to a cleanup or they are involved in some project and that then brings them into this idea of more conservation and they change their behaviors at home to be more environmentally conscious. So I don't think it goes one way or the other. I think it depends on the person and both are so important. <clears throat> I've been involved with this program called Don't Feed the Toxic Monster for quite some time. And some of the simple solutions are very similar to uh, We Are Puget Sound. So I'll let uh, Mindy talk about that at the end. But the big deal, the big message I always like to share is that these simple solutions when done by many have a tremendously powerful effect. I kind of call it the Kaizen theory of environmentalism. Many small steps done 
by a multitude of people can have an amazing effect. We always say that Puget Sound is being killed, a death by a thousand paper cuts. But I believe that we can also save Puget Sound with all of these millions of tiny, tiny solutions, these acts, these acts of kindness towards our environment. So, but it's time to do more because I can't just share all of my diving videos. I'm doing this project called Virtual Sailor Sea where I'm filming all the major dive sites. So that's like 30 or 40 dive sites in Puget Sound that divers visit regularly and the habitats that they visit. And I'm making that available to uh, educators around, around the region so that when they're talking about Puget Sound and they talk about a kelp forest or they talk about a rocky marine habitat, that then they can just put on a headset, have the kids have headsets and everybody looks around and sees really what we're talking about. And I've been tremendously well supported by Oculus. They've sent me over a hundred headsets to um, support this program. And unfortunately COVID kind of, uh, put the brakes on the project. We were gonna be going around with We Are Puget Sound, the book tour and doing virtual reality events at all of the book signings and book events. But unfortunately with COVID that kind of held us up. So the next project I'm working with is um, a maritime archeology span simulator. And <laughs> what does this mean? People are like, <laughs> right. So I have a friend on the East Coast, his name's uh, Evan Kofax, and he does the most amazing photogrammetry I've ever seen. And what I mean by photogrammetry is he takes a zillion pictures of something underwater and then he stitches them all together in post in, um, on the computer afterwards and makes this amazing 3D image that you can actually view in a headset. And I thought, well, that's pretty cool, but or on Sketchfab. But let's take it one step further. What if we take those uh, things that he scans and we put them into a 360 degree virtual reality video game type environment that looks really real because it's actually made from really real photographs? So this is a plane wreck in the Marshall Islands. So what happens when you put it all together? This is that same plane wreck. They've scanned it with LIDAR and they've taken a million photographs of it, maybe not quite a million, but a whole lot of photographs. And then they've reformatted it, recalculated it, put it all together in post and made this beautiful model. We've done this with some other things. You can see this is the sea array uh, swimming along that's um, got three cameras in it and it's going snap, 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 snap as they scooter along so that he can cover a huge shipwreck debris field. This shipwreck debris field is over a thousand feet long. So as you can imagine, that can get a little confusing at times. And so he also goes out and shoots 360 degree video of that. So that's 10 cameras in a circle taking, um, taking photos and then in taking video, sorry, and then I stitch it together in post so that we can do a virtual dive. We can swim through that wreck just like he did. Here is a photogrammetry. Um, there's where we've pieced all those pictures together and you can see a portion. This is just a portion of this debris field. Now, if I'm a diver and I'm a diving archeologist or even just a hobbyist, um, a recreational diver, and I'm going to this site, you can see that if I'm looking for something very specific, I'm gonna have to cover a lot of ground. The idea of the Mar Maritime Archeology span Simulator is that you can go visit it before you ever visit it. And what happens then is if you're gonna go look at something, I wanna dive on the bow, right? Well, how do you even know you're on the bow if you're on a thousand feet of debris? You need to have seen it before. Once you've dove things a few times, you are like, oh yeah, I swim to the rock and I hang a left. It's called dead reckoning or deductional uh, reckoning. And so that's how we find our way around a lot because there's no maps underwater really. <laughs> there's no street sign saying, oh, shipwreck right over there. So. With this maritime archaeology span simulator, <clears throat> you can see we can move stuff around. And this is actually in, in Sketchfab. This isn't the actual simulator. But what I'm building it in a way that you can actually highlight the things you want to see or share. And so you could dive through this rack. And now we're looking at, um, at, a, at, a, um, at an artifact or a point of interest. And so this will help divers and maritime archaeologists see what they're going for. The conditions also change. If you're in Sketchfab and you're looking at a 3D model and you're spinning it around and you're like, yeah, sure, okay, I got it, I got it. Sometimes 
it doesn't look that same way when you get down there. It's dark down there. So you're only seeing your pinpoint view, just like this video. Sometimes it's pitch black and you can't see anything but what's in your light. So you really need this time to learn these things. So when you see them in the video or in life, in real life, you know exactly where you are. So hopefully building this, um, this basically it's a video game. It's built in a video uh, engine uh, in Unity um, so that anyone can go for these dives on these shipwrecks and explore them and hopefully connect to uh, the shipwrecks and habitats uh, under our um, ocean. And so I'd like to kind of wrap up with how um, honored I am to be a part of this program. And I'm really looking forward to everybody getting their vaccines so that we can get back out and I can actually share all of this with every one of you in person. Um, it's really, it's meaningful to me. And I love to see your faces when you get that first look of the world that I have spent my whole life, basically my whole adult life protecting. All right, anybody have any questions? Thank oh, also, you. if you want to, sorry, also, if you wanted to test out that maritime archaeology simulator, reach out to me um, offline in Messenger on Facebook, find me, whatever, and I can send you a demo. Great. Thank you so much, Laura. So Laura takes the three-dimensional view, Brian, two-dimensional view, but it's all about really connecting people in, in one way or another. And you've just seen some really remarkable ways of, of how to do that. Um, so we've had a couple questions come in through uh, Facebook Live as well as through the, the chat button here. Um, so I'm just gonna pose the first question to Brian. Um, Brian, have you noticed any places that have changed for the worse or better as you photograph the area over the years? Well, there's been a lot of changes in Puget Sound since I've lived in Olympia. Um, I commented that a lot of marine birds that I used to see on Capitol Lake, I don't see anymore. I used to see canvas back and uh, golden eye, scoters, um, cinnamon teal, lots of very fascinating birds, and they're just not there anymore. And there are more common birds. You see widgeon and coots and lots of mergans, I mean, lots of, excuse me, uh, uh, mallards, uh, but not some of the more interesting birds to me. So I'm, I'm disappointed by that. I do de definitely see a decline. I hope it's cyclical, but I, I don't know. It may be loss of habitat. Uh, there's been certainly habitat improvements, on the other hand. Uh, perhaps the most dramatic one in, in the area where I live is in the Nisqually Delta, where the removal of the, the dike around um, the Browns Farm and uh, the restoration of the salt marsh there. And that area, it's still going to take many decades probably for it to fully restore, but it's on the path to restoration. So I'm very heartened by that. And then, of course, you go up to the Elwha is another example where the uh, two dams were removed there. And uh, that area is also getting salmon back already. So. Uh, there's some really good news out there as well. Thank you for that. Yeah, really national level um, investments in, in habitat restoration in, in our area, which is so important. Um, and Laura, question for you, since you work in stormwater so much, what needs to happen to reduce stormwater impacts on Puget Sound? <laughs> um, well, <laughs> a lot of the simple solutions that We Are Puget Sound describes in your whole um, program. Um, but the simplest ones are really very, very simple things like picking up dog poop and driving a little bit less. And because they just had this study on, um, they just had this study and found that it was something in the tire rubber that is killing our coho salmon um, and causing the, causing the, um, oops, yeah, I didn't mean myself, sorry, <laughs> just triple checking that, that are causing the pre-spawn mortality. And we've known that for a long time, but we didn't have the proof, the actual chemical. And so now Jen McIntyre and the team at the Stormwater Center have, have honed in on that. And uh, it's just pick up pet waste, properly dispose of waste, uh, use car wash facilities that actually collect the sludge as opposed to washing your car and washing all that, that road grime right off into the storm drains on your street. Um, walk, bike, and ride public transit. Um, a big one is plant and protect your native evergreens because those are Puget Sound evolved in concert with our, our plants and our geology. And so to think that all of these unnatural plants and these other trees and species are good for the habitat, actually they're not. 
we need to put back what nature intended in my mind. Um, and along with that is practicing natural yard care. Um, use less fertilizers, use less pesticides, really try to find a natural way, pull out that grass and put in a salmon friendly yard. And then another very important one is slow the fire hose effect by keeping the water in your yard with rain barrels, rain gardens, um, cisterns and putting in poor surfaces so that you don't have the water rushing along, picking up all the garbage, uh, all the pollutants. So those would be simple personal actions that each and one of us can do every day. Like I try to do, I mean, it's not such a big thing right now because we're all driving so much less, but I want to say I saw a huge difference uh, with the onset of COVID and people stopping driving. I saw a massive difference underwater. No one's talking about that, but the storm drains were cleaner. Honestly, they just, I was out with the same storm drains that I've been diving for a decade and everything looked different. It just looked different. So we have the power to change this, to fix this, to help this. We also have the power to make it worse. We just have to make the right decision. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, and, and you mentioned rain gardens. I'm actually putting a rain garden in my uh, yard in Tacoma right now. I'm super excited about that. Uh, but we also had a, uh, a, a We Are Puget Sound event in spring of 2020 about uh, building your own rain gardens. And there's, there's a great book uh, resource there through Braided River as well. Um, one of the other questions is, where can I get the book? I just put in uh, braidedriver.org uh, is a great place to start, or there's a lot of local bookstores that are, are carrying We Are Puget Sound. Um, so you can support Braided River as well as your local bookstore by, by finding it there. Um, and Laura, I, one, one other question for you, because we talked about bookstores, and yes, yeah, so for everybody, well, this particular event got rescheduled like four times, so that's why we're glad we're having it. We wished it could have been in person uh, because we wanted you to be able to try on the virtual reality, um, the head, headgear, and, and you, mm -hmm. you uh, shared that with me, and we had a, a presentation uh, last year as well. It was so fun to walk around in the store. You got to make sure you don't trip over anything, and you know, um, you can basically look underwater, except that you're walking around an actual physical place. But um, where do you have any idea where people can actually start to experience this in person, or are we in yeah. virtual reality? <laughs> um, that look like? Yeah. If people have a virtual reality headset, um, a lot of my videos are already up on YouTube, but I'm going to be building out a virtual Sailor Sea website proper where they can just go and um, it'll be, uh, if they have an Oculus headset, it'll be in the Oculus Media Studio. And so I'll have a link there to that where people can just click on it and it'll show up right in their headset next time they put it on. And so unfortunately that does mean that people are gonna need their own headsets, but there's a lot of things we can do with these headsets beyond just watch my videos. <laughs> And then as, as soon as as soon as COVID let up, um, I'm absolutely going to be back out everywhere I can go with, um, um, you know, library events, community center events, school events, and book signing events. Yes, we, we hope to be out there in 2022. Um, meanwhile, Brian, a question for you is, um, maybe as, as we're still waiting for the world to open up again, uh, are there ways that people can improve their own photography skills? And maybe that's everybody from cell phone photographers to, to other students. Are there any resources out there that might, they might look into now and then start, uh, start developing a new skill? Yeah, I, I've been teaching photography classes for about the last eight to 10 years. And uh, it's helpful because uh, people who have, let's say, single reflex cameras or even now these newer mirrorless cameras, these cameras are very powerful and uh, complex <laughs> and they can do amazing things, but most people don't understand some of the really basic things their camera can do. So it does help. So even if you take a short class, I offer like a two hour class and I give hands on instruction with people. Uh, it really helps just to understand things like how to adjust the shutter speed, how to uh, change the aperture on your camera so you can increase or decrease the depth of field. There's a lot of creative controls you can get with the camera when you uh, start uh, getting away from the automatic settings and going to more manual settings. So I would encourage that. There's a lot of stuff on YouTube videos as well and books galore on how to use your camera. But I find it, at least for a lot of people, having somebody in person showing them and actually holding their camera and showing them how to adjust the dial or get to that menu is, is the most helpful. 
Anne writes in browsers books in Olympia. Brian, you did a, a book signing there um, in, in the before times as well. Um, so last question to both of you um, in flipping through uh, your, your copy of the book here. Um, what's, can you just name one, one particular image that stands out to you and why that you would like people to see? So any particular image in the book or topic in the book uh, that you wanted to draw people's attention to? To grab my copy. <laughs> All right, I, I put you on the spot, Laura. Any um, any thoughts on on that? Anything particularly inspiring for you, or subjects? Um, I th I think for me the inspiring thing is actually the the book on a whole. I think the idea of community coming together, all these aspects. None of us can work in a vacuum. And what I have seen through the years and working with EcoNet and Peter Donaldson and many of the other luminaries, uh, environmental luminaries in our region, is that we end up working in silos, um, separate from each other, doing similar things and fighting for the same grant money and the same funding. And I believe that if we could work together more and collaborate more, that we would actually have a much broader effect and stronger effect. So for me, the book on a whole is what is powerful, showing all of these groups and all of these people as a, as a, as a whole, not an individual organization as much as a broad swath of interest and in caring for our environment and our future. Thank you, Laura. All right, Brian, back, back putting you on the spot. What do you think? So it's this picture here on page 11 and it shows uh, Mount Rainier in the distance and I'm standing on uh, the shoreline of Anderson Island. I'll confess I'd never been to Anderson Island before but I was determined to get a picture like this because I know Anderson Island has best, the best vantage point on Mount Rainier while still having a kind of a natural shoreline presence there. Uh, Oro Bay is just exquisite and this, this point that comes out there. So I took the ferry one winter a couple of years ago and uh, with great hopes of getting this photo and more often than not in photography, it's kind of like baseball. Most of the time you strike out, but every once in a while you get the perfect light and the perfect weather. And this was one of those magical moments. And so I think it kind of captures almost a 19th century kind of view of the sound where you see the water and the forest and Mount Rainier in the distance. And so there's all these different regimes of, of the natural world all within the same vantage point to see from sort of glacier to sea. It's, it's such a unique experience here in the lower 48 states. It's very rare that you get to see that a mountain range with its headwaters of the river all the way down to the salt water. And so I, it's just an extraordinary place. If you haven't been there, I would recommend that. Thank you, Brian. And, and I, I think too, in kind of reflecting back on the year that, that has passed, I think I can't imagine kind of writing this out any place else. We're so fortunate to have these places in our backyard and not just the places, but the communities, the wildlife as well um, that relies on all of that. And as Laura put it, that really is about the heart of what we are Puget Sound is, is all about. And I wanna say also that I, I talked about the sort of physical landscape and the wildlife, but this is really a social and cultural landscape we live in. And it is every bit as rich as the natural landscape that is here and the people and the, the so many different cultures and the vibrancy of that. And I, I try to appreciate that every day. I don't need to be on a mountain trail or kayaking to, to appreciate that. I can be in a city, I can be in a small town, I could be on a farm somewhere. And it's all part of our, our experience here. And it's that diversity here that is our strength. And I think we need to always celebrate that and keep that in mind. And the only way we're gonna restore Puget Sound is to reach out to all of the communities, all the people who are impacted to correct some of the uh, injustice we've had, the environmental justice issues where we've we've put things that have not been very um, clean industries or things next to neighborhoods where people didn't have the political power to fight it. So I just hope we can all keep that in mind as we as we move forward. Thank you, Brian. Yep, we we will not save Puget Sound and leave some communities behind. So clearly there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Well, thank you. Thank you both for that. And I think just by, by way of wrap up here, uh, virtual high five. Thank you, uh, Laura and Brian for your time. We sure, sure appreciate it. Um, and I just wanted to, to close with a couple of things. There's more resources for you at wearepugetsound.org under action or these particular 10 actions you can do even more on. We, we roll out about one a month. 
Um, so you can sign up to be uh, notified of actions under wearepugetsound.org. You can follow us on social media under so on um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or in my vernacular, InstaSnap face chat, because that's just who I am. Um, but we also wanted to share with people that um, Mountaineers Books is offering a, a lovely promo code right now um, under Earth Day 21. So if you if you go to Mountaineers Books and you check out there um, using Earth Day 21. Uh, for the promo code. And let, let me actually just, I just had a little wonder, like, did I get the number right? I'm pretty sure it's 25%. It's 25% off. Okay, I had to double check a text message so I don't get in trouble. Um, but huge thank you to uh, to Braided River um, for all of your support with this. And, and then a thank you to, to Bainbridge Island Museum of Art. It was a real, um, it was a real a gift to be part of, of Momentum Festival and the ideas behind Momentum Festival are connecting people and connecting people with each other, with the places um, that define us. And something that Laura mentioned in, in, her, um, in her talk is in the book as well. It's a quote from Margaret Mead, um, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So it's programs like Momentum Festival that are building community that are helping us identify what needs to be done and how we're going to do it. Um, so thank you very much to Emma and the Hunter behind the scenes. Uh, thank you, everyone. There was a question about, is this, gonna, is this recorded? Yes, it is recorded. And I believe, Emma, I don't know if you can come off of mute. Um, it would, should be available through the uh, Momentum Festival and we'll put it on wearepugetsound.org as well. Absolutely. Yep, it'll be on our um, Facebook page and on our YouTube account archived there. Thank you so much, everybody. All right. Thank you. Good night, all.